Um, Chuck Board's my name, and I'm affiliated with this fine institution, have been for a long time. Today marks the last day of our president's first year in office, and we thought it might be appropriate, interesting, and maybe even fun to do our own assessment of <coughs> that first year in office, in both in a positive and a negative way, as such assessments are always done. And uh, to set the stage um, uh, for what we're about to do, I got some help this morning from uh, Joseph Epstein in the Wall Street Journal, which I'm going to read to you. <coughs> The best definition, this is a cynical uh, reading, <clears throat> the best definition of democracy is rule by the people most skilled at pandering for votes. Those who do it best, in the conservative philosopher Michael Oakeshott's memorable phrase, are able to manufacture curable grievances. The cure, they promise, naturally, is to be found in electing themselves to office. Um, <clears throat> we have a president that certainly um, pointed out to us some uh, grievances, and, uh, and, and he made it clear that he was uh, the only one uh, that was really capable of solving them, curing them. So we're going to see how well he did that in this first year in office. And to do that, we have two able panelists, um, the first of which is uh, Dr. Niall Gardiner, who is the director of the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom and Heritage, uh, and uh, a chap who has more academic uh, degrees than Carter has little liver pills, most uh, important of which would be a PhD from Yale and a BA and a MA from Oxford. Widely published uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And he's uh, going to speak to uh, the virtues of this first year in office of our president. Uh, Dov Zakheim, who is uh, also affiliated with this institution and has been for a long time, is no slouch himself when it comes to academic credentials. Having uh, Columbia, the London School of Economics, and St. Anthony, Anthony's at uh, Oxford under his belt. Your moderator went to the University of Kansas. Um, <clears throat> I've asked each to speak uh, approximately 10 minutes and, and uh, Niall is going to go first, and uh, I ask you to maintain rapt attention and uh, prepare yourself for questions later. So Niall, go ahead. Well, thank you very much, uh, General, for that very, very kind, uh, generous introduction, and thank you very much to the Center for National Interest for the, uh, the very uh, kind invitation to speak uh, to you today. And uh, I have to say that um, the, the lunch uh, here at the uh, Center for National Interest is absolutely outstanding. I think the, the best think tank food in Washington. So um, <laughs> uh, a mar marvelous uh, meal to kick off. Uh, and uh, as the general mentioned, I, I, um, uh, I'll be presenting the case today uh, for why the administration's uh, foreign policy is um, you know, positive, uh, successful in some respects, effective. Um, I'll be giving a sort of big picture overview. Only have a, a few minutes. I'm going to run through a series of um, of areas of foreign and national security uh, policy. Um, over the last year, I've had um, you know a number of opportunities to to work with different parts of the administration on aspects of uh, foreign policy and national security uh, policy. In terms of my own background, um, uh, I didn't work for the, um, you know, for the Trump uh, 
transitional Trump campaign. I, I worked as a foreign policy advisor to Senator Ted Cruz, uh, and previously I worked as a uh, foreign policy advisor on the, um, the, the Romney presidential uh, campaign. Um, and so, you know, so I'm bringing a perspective that is somewhat uh, sort of, um, you know, distant to the, you know, the, the, the Trump sort of transition um, uh, side of things, but a perspective based upon, you know, having worked with a lot of, you know, Trump officials over the last year, and also having worked with a w very wide variety of, um, you know, foreign, uh, you know, delegations have come to Washington, especially from from Europe, and so have gained a lot of perspectives from um, uh, from dozens of different, uh, you know, different countries uh, as well. And uh, but to to start off, I, I think. Uh, Overall, the the team that um, President Trump has put in place uh, has been very effective on the national security foreign policy uh, side, especially uh, General Mattis, uh, General Master, um, Mike Pompeo at the CIA, CIA um, Nikki Haley, I think the uh, US ambassador to the UN has been probably the star of the cabinet, actually. Uh, I think she's been absolutely outstanding. And I think that uh, you know, Trump has demonstrated um, a sort of knack for appointing, you know, good, uh, good, talented people in the key positions, I think, that impact uh, most of us here on the foreign policy uh, front. And uh, the, the new national security strategy uh, unveiled in December, uh, personally by, unveiled by the president himself, which is, which is fairly unusual, I think. Um, I think this was a very carefully put together uh, document uh, Nadia Shadler, the NSC, shepherded the process. Uh, I think that um, they did actually a very good job with this document. Uh, I, I, I do believe it's a superior uh, strategy to the 2015 Obama administration uh, strategy. Uh, very, very different in, in style and approach. A much more assertive, robust projection of American uh, global power. The fact that um, the, uh, the, the Russian government swiftly condemned the strategy, I think, was a very good sign. Uh, and I think you've seen a return over the last year to a much more uh, um, unapologetic, um, assertive, uh, and, and overall robust uh, foreign policy, and that's reflected in the national security strategy. There's a very strong emphasis as well, I think, on national sovereignty, a big theme, I think, running throughout the, the first year of the Trump presidency, and uh, I think uh, Trump's speech before the United Nations uh, in September for the General Assembly is a very good example of that. And if you look at the language that uh, you know, Trump uh, used throughout that speech, the, the biggest takeaway really was his support for the idea of nation states, self-determination, taking back control of borders, um, and quite a lot of synergy there actually with, with a lot of the language, in fact, of the, uh, you know, the Brexit campaign in Britain, interesting enough. So I'll talk a bit more about that, uh, about that later. But uh, so I think, in terms of the, uh, the national security strategy and the big picture doctrine of the, the administration, um, I think there are a lot of positives there and, and a firm rejection of the idea that you should you know, appease America's enemies, curry favor with America's enemies, and so a firm rejection of the idea of you know, extending the hand of friendship to uh, Iran, Cuba, et cetera. Um, and so um, you know, much in that document that uh, you know, we would certainly agree with very strongly at the, you know, the Heritage uh, Foundation. Um, the, the biggest sort of underreported story of last year, without a doubt, I think, was the, the emphatic uh, military success in Iraq and Syria. And just last year alone, uh, I think five million people were, were liberated. I think a total of 7.7 .7 million people have been liberated over the past couple of years in Iraq and Syria. Uh, ISIS has reduced to just 2% uh, of its former territory, and that, that uh, still remains in Syria. Uh, and, you know, without a doubt, I think this is a, you know, this is a sort of staggering achievement. This is the speed of the, uh, the liberation of both of those countries from ISIS's grip uh, has been absolutely uh, extraordinary. I think a, a lot of that is due to the fact that uh, the, the Trump administration has uh, given a great deal of, uh, I think, freedom to uh, U.S. generals to operate. Um, uh, in the best interests of the United States. And so the shackles were taken off in terms of, I think, the freedom of the US military to be able to operate and lead that coalition effectively in both Iraq and Syria. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, you have to, if you're looking at the overall Trump foreign policy in the first year, you have to, I, I think, e even his strongest critics will have to acknowledge 
that uh, you know, the operations in, in the Middle East have been very, very successful, and it's an example of strong, bold U.S. leadership. And at the end of the day, if the United States doesn't lead, nothing is going to happen in terms of uh, you know, defeating the enemies of the, of the free world. And so uh, President Trump has been far less isolationist than expected. Uh, and, and I think that you have seen a U.S. administration that is very engaged internationally, uh, that is very willing to project American uh, global power, even more so, I think, or far more so than the Obama administration. Uh, so you've seen the sort of leading from behind uh, mentality, uh, I think, sort of thrown out of the window over the past year. But this is a president who is emphatically not an isolationist uh, and who believes in uh, you know, a very strong U.S. footprint uh, on the on the world uh, world stage, and that I think has been reassuring for many uh, U.S. allies in Europe, in particular, especially in Eastern and Central Europe. And um, moving to the Russian front, uh, I've been very, um, uh, I think, pleasantly surprised by the uh, the strength of the uh, the Trump administration's approach towards Russia. In my view, a deadly threat to uh, American interests in uh, in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, you've seen the strengthening of sanctions, you've seen the rebuilding of U.S. military power in Europe, uh, you've seen the, um, the willingness to send defensive weapons to Ukraine, which the Obama administration did not, uh, did not agree to. Um, you've seen the, the sale of the, the Patriot missile system to Poland, a decision which went down extremely well in, in Warsaw. Um, uh, you saw the president giving uh, in my view, an outstandingly good speech in Warsaw that sent absolutely the right message to, uh, to Russia and other uh, strategic adversaries of the United States, and also very powerful defense of the West, Western values, Western civilization. Uh, and, and I think his, his Warsaw speech was actually the, the most important speech uh, so far of the, uh, of the Obama presidency in terms of foreign policy. Um, on Iran, the approach uh, has been far, far better than the Obama administration's approach on Iran. I think the Iran nuclear agreement uh, has been a, a spectacular failure in many respects. Uh, and the president has rightly called for the agreement to be strengthened. Otherwise, uh, as he made clear last Friday, the United States will walk away from the deal. And I think that is the right, uh, the right approach. He's thrown down the gauntlet to America's uh, European allies, in particular France, Germany, Great Britain. Uh, to come forward and strengthen the Iran uh, nuclear agreement. Uh, and uh, I mean, no doubt I think the, the president will walk away from the, uh, from the deal 120 days or so from now if, uh, if America's European allies are not willing to, uh, to make changes or uh, add additional provisions to that agreement, for example, including the elimination of uh, the, some of the sunset clauses uh, and also including uh, restrictions, for example, on uh, Iran's uh, ballistic missile um, uh, advances. Uh, and also, uh, very heartening to see the administration very strongly condemn the Iranian regime uh, with regard to its handling of the recent protests. In contrast, the European Union was, uh, you know, silent as a Trappist monk over the issue. Uh, Mogherini's stance on, on Iran was absolutely appalling. Uh, and uh, just a few days ago, you saw uh, European Union foreign ministers meeting with the Iranian foreign minister. Um, just a few days after the, uh, the suppression of, uh, brutal suppression of the protests. Uh, and in contrast, on the, on the US side, there was very, very strong condemnation of Tehran and also uh, a call for the Iran nuclear agreement to be, uh, to be uh, strengthened. Uh, with regard to uh, Europe as, as a whole, um, uh, I think the, the new administration has certainly adopted a more Eurosceptic approach towards the EU, which I think is very welcome. Uh, the Obama administration's approach was very pro-Euro-Federalist uh, in favor of the idea of ever closer union in Europe. Um, President Trump, as, as many of you will know, is a very strong supporter of Brexit. Uh, and uh, his administration has strongly backed a US-UK free trade deal. The negotiations, the discussions over that are already uh, starting. Uh, and so there's less focus upon dealing with Brussels uh, and uh, dealing with supranational entities, more focus upon dealing with nation states. That's been to uh, significantly the benefit of uh, countries like Great Britain, for example, but also Poland, the rising power of Eastern Europe, has greatly benefited from the Trump approach. Uh, and if you speak to you know, a wide range of uh, you know, leaders in Eastern and Central Europe, they generally have a very positive approach, actually, uh, po positive view of the, 
the Trump administration's uh, foreign policy so far. Uh, undoubtedly, there are strains between uh, Washington and Berlin. I think the US-German relationship is very tense at this time. Um, and you've seen a significant decline, I think, in sort of German influence here in Washington. Um, with regard to the French, I think that uh, you know, Trump has struck a very pragmatic relationship with Emmanuel Macron. They seem to be able to do business together despite uh, clear ideological differences. So, you know, Trump, uh, I think, dem has demonstrated, I think, a, you know, a fair amount of pragmatism as well when it comes to dealing with international leaders. And, um, you know, the idea that this administration has sort of blown up, you know, traditional U.S. alliances or offended allies and so on, I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of that is, is you know, sort of way over the top. Um, and if you look at, um, you know, the broader transatlantic alliance, the relationship with a lot of individual countries, I think, uh, is very, very strong, actually, uh, at this time. And also, uh, I think uh, the Trump administration has done a good job in terms of rebuilding partnerships in the Middle East with uh, especially Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, for example, the Gulf states. Um, the administration starts on Iran has, uh, you know, been very uh, broadly welcomed among many U.S. allies in the in the region. Um, and so, uh, and also to just to mention on, on the NATO uh, issue, we've seen an increase in, uh, you know, commitments to increase defense spending um, among European NATO allies for the first time in decades. And so, so the sort of tough love approach taken by President Trump on Euro European soil uh, has actually begun to reap uh, dividends. Uh, and we are seeing a more serious approach being taken by um, European allies in terms of spending more on their own defense. Of course, a lot more needs to be done uh, on, that, uh, on that front. Uh, just finally, um, I've gone through a lot of positives, just a couple of uh, you know, caveats. Uh, I think that uh, with regard to North Korea, uh, there needs to be greater clarity in the messaging from the administration. There's too much mixed messaging on North Korea. Um, there's been a lot of you know, strong language, strong talk, but uh, there hasn't been enough strength in terms of the application and enforcement of sanctions against North Korea. Uh, for example, Chinese banks uh, are playing a big role in propping up that regime. No action has been taken against those, uh, those banks by US authorities. Um, and with regard to Russia, uh, sometimes the, the, the rhetoric coming from President Trump himself doesn't match the strong policies in place from the administration. I'd like to see uh, President Trump personally standing up to uh, Vladimir Putin uh, and uh, calling personally on the Russians to get out of Crimea, out of Ukraine altogether. Uh, and um, also, we need to see stronger US backing for Russian dissidents as well, just as Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan stood with dissidents in Russia. Uh, we need to see uh, President Trump himself and this administration uh, doing so. Uh, but, but overall, um, you know, I have to say, I, I think this, uh, you know, this administration uh, has done uh, uh, rather well, actually, on the foreign policy front. Uh, it's a lot more effective, I believe, than the Obama administration's uh, foreign policy, uh, which, which, in my view, was extremely uh, weak need, confusing, and left a lot of America's allies um, uh, out in the cold, actually. And so, uh, so I think that. Um, uh, there's much to be commended in this, uh, this administration's approach. Uh, there's still room for uh, significant criticism as well, but, but I think overall they've made a very good start uh, for this presidency on the world stage. Uh, and, and I hope that we're going to continue to see a robust approach uh, and a, uh, an even stronger uh, approach taken uh, in 2018, putting America's adversaries on notice while reassuring America's allies that the United States uh, stands uh, with them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Niall. And um, before we move to, to, to the other side of the, question, uh, the, the uh, equation here, let me just ask you one thing. You, you spoke uh, of the virtue of, of strong U.S. Uh, uh, global leadership and, uh, and uh, seemed to believe that, uh, that our current president has acquitted himself well in that, uh, by that measurement. Um, Gallup uh, produced a, a, a poll finding yesterday which showed global um, view of the U.S. leadership at the lowest level since polling began. An 18-point drop from a year ago <coughs> and, uh, just before Trump took office. How, how do you reconcile that with, with your view on his... Yeah. Uh, no, that, that's an extremely uh, 
you know, good question. And I was just looking at that poll uh, this morning, the Gallup uh, poll, uh, and the poll showed, I would say, significant unpopularity for President Trump um, and the United States in general, actually, in many parts of the world. Uh, I think similar um, polling was conducted in the days of the, the, you know, the Bush administration. Similar conclusions, I think, um, drawn from those polls. Uh, President Obama's administration was a lot more popular, um, uh, especially in, uh, you know, in Europe, for example. And, um, but, you know, world leadership isn't a popularity contest. Uh, I think that um, while Obama, you know, may have been sort of praised to the heavens in, in a lot of the, you know, European press, for example, what did he actually deliver as, uh, as leader of the free world? Um, I'm very little, actually. Uh, and, uh, in fact, I think the, the Obama years on the world stage were very negative in terms of the projection of American power. You saw withdrawal of U.S. power. Um, and so when you have a, uh, an administration that is much more aggressive and proactive, um, that's going to certainly I have, a, have an impact in opinion polls. And I think you're going to see a pushback against the United States, actually, in terms of public polling. The most important uh, factor, though, to look at is, is the relationship with individual um, uh, leaders. Uh, and I think that uh, on that front, you know, the administration has overall done, uh, done pretty well. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's far more important than necessarily public opinion in, you know, foreign, um, uh, foreign countries. I was struck, though, by the fact that, the, you know, the country that came out sort of top of the, top of the pops uh, in terms of the polling, um, in terms of international sort of public approval was Germany. Um, and, um, you know, it has to be said that the, the, the Germany on the world stage um, really, uh, you know, it cannot be compared to the United States in terms of global influence or power. Um, and in fact, Germany's, uh, you know, reach beyond Europe is very, very limited. Uh, and, um, and perhaps, you know, that, that's a reason why, you know, um, their support for for Germany in these in these polls because you know Germany doesn't necessarily take a lot of actions that that can be conjured as as sort of uh, offensive or or aggressive or uh, you know and so they're less likely to offend on the world stage and I think it's as simple as that but the fact is Germany is a declining European power um, you'll see the balance of power shifting in Germany uh, sorry in Europe away from Germany. Um, you're seeing a, uh, a growing challenge uh, from Eastern Central Europe to typical German hegemony in, in Europe. Uh, I, I'm no doubt, I think, that Brexit Britain uh, will significantly overshadow Germany eventually on, on every uh, front, including economic as well, as Germany's population declines. Uh, Germany's population will fall by the end of the century, probably to about 60 million. The UK's will rise to about uh, 80 million, according to various projections. Um, and so, you know, I, I think you do have to take these polls with a sort of pinch of pinch of salt. They're very interesting, of course, and you know we should study them closely. Uh, but they're not really a reflection, I think, of um, often of, of global uh, reality. And even though uh, the United States may be unpopular on the world stage at this time, if the U.S. were to withdraw or pull back on the world stage, then everyone would be complaining about the lack of U.S. leadership. Uh, where are the Americans now? They'd be saying. So you know, you can't have it sort of both ways. Really. Very well. Dove? Well, let, me start, minutes. Yeah. let me start off by saying that uh, I, too, was uh, a Romney advisor. Um, I was also a senior advisor to Jeb Bush. And having signed two letters uh, about Mr. Trump, I'm certainly not his favorite. Uh, but having said that, uh, my issue with what Niall said is not with what he said, but what he didn't say. Uh, I would say 90% of what you said is absolutely accurate. So here's what I think was left out, and then we can argue about whether what was left out is more important than what was left in. First of all, our image is in the dirt around the world. There's no other way to put it. I just came back last night from my fifth trip to Britain in 12 months. I've been to Russia. I've been to China. I've been to Israel. I've been to the Arab world. Our image is awful. And that's important because we do stand for something more than military might. 
we've always told ourselves that whether it is what neocons want to do, which I don't particularly want to do, which is to change the world in our image so everybody will be like Mike, or whether it's more my own predilection, which is with John Quincy Adams, to be an example for the world, right now we're doing neither. And that is a huge blow to our leadership, quite frankly. So that's number one. Number two, which is related to that, is it's taken a very long time to convince people that they should ignore the president's tweets, that they should ignore his statements, they sh that they should look at what we actually do. By and large, that's right. But every so often, it's impossible to ignore. And when it becomes impossible to ignore, we run into trouble. For example, what was just said about Africa. Now, quite frankly, whether it's shithole, shithouse, or just pure shit, that is not what you expect the President of the United States to say publicly. And that was public, because Democrats were there. That guarantees publicity. Um, publicly about other countries, or an entire continent, for that matter. That undermines us. And it's very hard to clean up the mess. You know, the old story about, I think it was Don Regan who said he was always cleaning up after the elephants. Well, we're, we have to clean up after the mastodon. It's not easy. Now, there are a lot of issues that fall below the level of the White House. And uh, I know Chris Peeble was there just today. Uh, anybody who heard Jim Mattis recognizes that if an issue doesn't rise to the level of the White House, it's in very competent hands. Mattis um, announced today what he's told many people, including myself, on many occasions, that he's in constant contact with Tillerson, who, by the way, you didn't mention. That is very important because Tillerson's image isn't exactly great, and he has lost all these senior State Department people, and they're not all communists, as Mr. McCarthy used to say. And so because the State Department does have a role to play, and because Tillerson's image has suffered, in part because of what the White House has said, it's critical that a guy like Mattis gets up there and stresses. How many times, Chris? Maybe five, six times today? Uh, over and over again. And the same thing with alliances. Because you have to remember, the President didn't start off saying nice things about alliances. He didn't start off saying nice things about Article 5. And it took a lot of time to demonstrate to people that, as Nal said, we're actually doing more in Europe than the Obama administration. But don't forget, at least from my perspective, doing better than the Obama administration ain't much. That is a very low bar to jump over. And so that in and of itself doesn't prove much. Same thing, by the way, with NATO spending. It's not at all clear to me that NATO is, is prepared to spend more money because of Mr. Trump's exhortations or because of what Mr. Putin's been doing. And my evidence for that is the non-NATO country that's actually doing a heck of a lot in that regard, which happens to be Sweden. They're not a NATO country, and they're not doing it because of Mr. Trump. They're doing it because they see what Mr. Putin's up to. So bear that in mind. Another thing, um, yes, our relations with Germany aren't great. I don't know what our relations with France really are. Uh, and oh, by the way, Mr. Macron is in Britain right now talking about some special kind of new defense relationship between the Brits and the French. I don't think it'll happen. It's been talked about before. There was the Saint Malo Agreement. There's been lots of this stuff. But the fact of the matter is that there seems to be a new impulse in Europe to do stuff on their own. And don't forget the Canadian foreign minister's speech about doing the same thing. And so again, you have to wonder whether everything that's been going on is necessarily in America's interest. Will they finally, I don't think they will, but could they finally go off on their own in a defense manner? That has been the, the nightmare of American administration since John F. Kennedy. Again, we need to be a little more or rather a little less enthusiastic about Mr. Trump's leadership in this regard. Then there's the question of authoritarians and his example. And you mentioned Central and Eastern Europe several times. Now, if you want to talk about the Baltic states, you're right on. You want to talk about Poland, which EU is about to, has already threatened to kick out? And why do the Poles, and why do the Hungarians, and why do the, does Mr. Erdogan feel their oats more and more now? 
because they look at what our Mr. Trump says about the media. And then the only issue is they can do even more to their media than Mr. Trump can do to his media. For that matter, Mr. Netanyahu can do more to his media. He loves Mr. Trump, and he made himself, in effect, media minister. I'm sure Mr. Trump would like to do that, but he can't. So if you look at Mr. Orban, if you look at Mr. Kaczynski, who's still running Poland, if you look at Mr. Erdogan, you've got to ask yourself, is the American example the shining city on the hill? What kind of a shining city? I think it's been pretty besmirched. So you've got that issue as well. Nile, Nile mentioned that we've restored confidence. Well, the Southeast Asians don't think so when you talk to them. The Australians don't think so when you talk to them. And you know, even this, the, the North and South Korea issue, leaving aside the rhetoric, which I'm not sure you can, is it really Mr. Trump's rhetoric that has brought the North and South together? Or is it the fact that China is South Korea's largest trading partner, shares with South Korea and North Korea and Russia and Japan a desire to keep the Korean Peninsula not united but separate? The only country of the six that really wants to unite the Korean Peninsula is us. And so could you envisage a deal spurred by China, which essentially says the American troops get out and everything is good? Could happen. I don't know who's really calling the shots in Seoul. I'm not sure it's us. So that's another issue to be concerned about. The Russia issue here, the Russia <coughs> investigation, is a massive diversion in terms of resources, in terms of people's attention. It's not just the essence of the thing, which I guess at some point we'll find out what really happened. It's that so much attention is being paid to it. And that in and of itself weakens everything else we want to do. Because everybody out there doesn't know where this thing's going to go, where it'll lead, and what it'll do to us. So it helps those who want to write us off to write us off. The Middle East, I think, uh, as Nal said, we've done pretty well. The Jerusalem gamble was amazing because there hasn't been anything like the reaction that people expected. But getting involved in the Qatar G GCC quarrel, um, and frankly, the Qataris have done some things that they probably shouldn't have done. But then you've got, you know, the, what is it, the 13 points, in effect, that uh, the four countries have, have ordered the Qataris to come up with, which essentially means giving up your sovereignty. I'm not sure we jumped into that one as well as we could have. And we need a united GCC. In fact, if we really care about keeping Iran locked in and keeping the Sunni Arab world with us, you don't want to divide a GCC. That, that's just not the way you want to have it. So there's that. Um, finally, I, I would say this. Uh, in terms of Brexit, I know that Nigel Farage, you know, comes here and he's on TV and he makes all these statements. But Nigel Farage wasn't really the issue why, why Britain voted to get out of the EU. Britain voted to get out of the EU because most Brits felt that they were being controlled by a foreign country, and Brits in particular don't like foreigners. They just don't. I'm not saying that every Brit believes the WAG starts across the channel, but a hell of a lot of them do. And so, the Polish plumber thing was really as much as anything else the cause of the problem. And by the way, I don't know what they're going to do when they, you know, even now the plumbing there is awful. Without the Polish plumbers, I don't know what the hell they're going to do. But the, whereas the vote here for Mr. Trump was an explosion against the system, the internal American system, the vote in Britain was an explosion against the externalities that were affecting the British system. That is totally, totally different. So what would be my bottom line? I would say that we've done remarkably well in, because the bar was low with Mr. Obama and the bar was even set even lower with Mr. Trump because of his tweets, because of his campaign statements and so on. We've done remarkably well, surprised a lot of people that we haven't been driven as far off course as people thought. 
okay, there is a long way to go. I don't think it is an issue of, well, we're on the 20-yard line, we're inside the red zone, and we just need that little push to score the touchdown. I'd say we're, we're still inside our own 50-yard line, probably closer to the 35, all right? Which means you've done 35%, you've done that well, and we have done some things remarkably well. And, and how Mr. Trump backed into getting the people he got, and certainly with, with HR, he backed into it. That was not his first choice. Um, with Tillerson, he's still there, despite some comments that were made. Um, the people he's got, and, and not just at that level, but the levels below, are people who are dedicated to serving their country. And they will do it well. I've left out one thing that I want to close with, and it's something that Nile didn't talk very much about at all, and that's trade. If you look at the national security strategy, I think it's, I agree, it's quite good insofar as it deals with classic foreign policy, classic defense. Trade is part of national security. It's as simple as that. And our trade policy is a national security disaster. There's no other way to put it. We, we're, we're still working very hard to break up NAFTA. We lost tremendous influence because we got out of the Asian agreement and basically opened the door to China. I mean, one, one uh, what is it, uh, one, route, one road, um, one belt, one road? Believe me, it wouldn't be anywhere near as strong. I mean, first of all, the Obama administration messed up by not getting involved in the development bank, granted. But one belt, one road would never be as strong if we had not pulled out of that trade agreement. And everybody's scrambling around either to have a trade agreement without the United States, think about that for a second, or simply to figure out a way to do something with China even more than they're already doing, and essentially bypassing us. And if we do the same on NAFTA, we're not going to help ourselves. So whereas the national security team, I think, has been able, by and large, to maintain an even keel, I think on trade we're keeling over. And I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Dov. Um, both of you uh, kept uh, uh, your assessment generally in the area of, uh, of foreign and security policy global leadership, et cetera. But um, I think it is also useful, and I'm going to ask you this, Dove, um, to think about <clears throat> the impact of, of this president's effect on, on the domestic economy and the domestic um, sense of well-being apart from politics. The fact that uh, the Dow has risen well over 5,800 points since he's taken office. Consumer confidence is the highest level it's been in 17 years. Um, un unemployment is the lowest it's been in 17 years. All under a constant, uh, almost violent, <laughs> A condemnation by much of the American press. Um, how do you account for that? Well, in the first place, when you point to the stock market, you've got to realize you have to be talking about people who own stock. And not everybody in America does. Uh, we've really got a dichotomy. It's almost uh, bimodal, the way this economy is going. On the one hand, you've got um, corporations that are delighted with uh, the new tax law. Uh, they're already sitting on cash, by the way. And what they've been doing is either in increasing dividends or buying back stock. So if you're a stockholder, you're in great shape. Now you're going to be in even better shape. If they wanted to do more cap capital expenditure, they would have done it. Um, they might do more now, but the fact of the matter is that the people who will benefit from this are the people who already are shareholders. So if you're not a shareholder, 
you've already got a problem, number one. Number two is let's look at that employment. Yes, we are at what economists call full employment. 4% and below is full employment. What kind of employment? Okay, if you're working in McDonald's or you're a greeter at Walmart, you're employed. But I would hardly call you a rocket scientist. And so, again, you've got this bimodal thing where, yes, employment is doing well, but you've got to disaggregate the statistics. Um, in a sense, therefore, the, the economies, you know, the, the, the fundamentals of the economy are very, very strong. The issue is, are they being properly distributed? And how do you distribute? Now, there are people who say, well, the best thing to do is raise taxes and increase government spending. I happen to think that's not a good way to do it. That's my own personal view. But there has to be some way to get those people who are not benefiting, who, by the way, are the Trump, the Trump core. It's the Trump core that's hurting the most in this booming economy, because that's been their problem for the last 20 years. The economy's been doing, you know, on balance, if you smooth out so that you even account for the Great Recession and just smooth out the last 20 years, you'll see that the people at the top quarter have done, I'm not saying top 1%, that's just a, phrase. But people in the top quarter, the quart, top quartile, have done quite well. People in the bottom quartile and even in the bottom half have pretty much stayed flat. That's the heart of this country. That's the middle class. That's Joe Sixpack and Mrs. Suburb. And those people have not done as well. And so that becomes the issue. If you don't believe that more bureaucracy is going to save this country's economy, and I happen to believe it won't, how do you then deal with that bottom half? That's an open question, and right now, I don't think we're dealing with it. All right, very well. So we open it up now, um, and uh, please, um, when you're called upon to speak, uh, please identify yourself uh, by name and by affiliation if you have such a thing. First hand I saw went right back there in the right rear. Thanks. Jacob Heilbrunn, National Interest. Dove, are you yearning for a Cold War era that has passed, that the United States, both in its diminution of power abroad, and in its return to a semi-oligarchical status at home is reverting to its normal posture. We're reverting domestically to what we had between the 1890s and, 18, and 1920s, which is frankly, we know that the upper class or the, the wealthiest did extremely well. And it simply wasn't the case for much of the rest of the population. And uh, maybe that's where we're headed again. And the same in foreign, in foreign policy, I would argue that Trump may be accelerating trends that probably would have taken longer to manifest themselves abroad. Or am I all wet? No, I don't think you're all wet. Um, I think you're ultra pessimistic. Um, Let's start with the domestic side. Uh, the United States was not uh, a superpower in the 1890s. And uh, it suffered from gold panics, all kinds of economic crises, lots of economic instability. Uh, and so it's not at all clear to me that reverting back to that era it wouldn't even be good for the rich. I mean, how many people jumped off buildings when, when Wall Street collapsed? Uh, and so the United States was actually the strongest in the 50s and 60s, when the middle class was strongest. So you might say, well, that correlates with the Cold War. I suspect that's a spurious correlation. Now, internationally, clearly anybody who thinks that we're going to revert back to a world where there are just two or three superpowers is, is kidding himself or herself. That's, the real question is, how do you manage to be a primus inter pares, which is very different from being uh, 
the indispensable power, which I don't think we ever were. Um, in that respect, the British do give us a model. And, you know, you are the ultimate uh, trump card, if I could use a strange metaphor. Uh, you're the ultimate trump card to keep stability in the world. That I think we can manage. And I think that our leadership in that regard is still looked for. For instance, if we really drew our horns completely in and allowed NATO to fall apart, what would then happen? I guarantee you we would wind up rebuilding defense-wise, spending even more money, probably winding up in a war. Same in East, East Asia as well. Because, you know, just like nature, security hates a vacuum. And if we leave the vacuum, somebody else is going to fill it. And we're not going to like who fills it. Okay, we had a couple over here, right here, sir. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. What I heard both speakers say, in effect, was that the world is still willing to cut the United States a lot of slack. That we're so damn important that no matter what we say or do, governments and chanceries and foreign ministries tend to swallow very hard and then take it. But as a former American diplomat, I don't think I've ever seen a time when so many foreign governments within their own regions were undertaking policies that basically assumed either an adversarial relationship to the United States or that the United States was irrelevant. For example, I don't think in the last thousand years you can find a time when Persia, Russia, and Turkey have all been on the same wavelength on, their region, on many of their regional questions. The fact that Russia and China uh, are, is, are become, have become partners to an extent that would have been unthinkable in either capital at any time in my lifetime. I could go on in other parts of the world. But people in many governments look at the United States in a very different way than they did under administrations of either political party at any time since the Second World War. And I think that does actually matter. Because, I mean, I happen to believe with Warren Buffett that America's best years are ahead. I may not live to see them, but I do believe they are ahead. But most governments in most parts of the world for the near term in which governments make policies are assuming either that the United States is going to be unpredictable, unreliable, or irrelevant. Comment. I think you just misunderstood me. I mean, I said that there are a lot of governments that are essentially working around. So maybe I wasn't as forceful as, as you've just been. Uh, but I don't disagree with you. Um, just as Mr. Obama in his small way united Israel and the Arabs against us, something no previous president had ever been able to do, um, Mr. Trump is bringing countries together. Now, I don't know whether he's bringing, you know, you might be giving him too much credit, frankly. Um, the interests of those three coincide. The Russians don't trust the Persians any more than they ever have. Um, the Russians and the Turks, after all, did fight Crimean wars. The, the Soviets did occupy northern Iran. I mean, they're not, th these are really, they're, these are one-night stands. Um, but I think at the, cr at the core of what you're saying, I think there's a lot of truth. We are, we're not being written off we are being uh, circumvented. Do you have anything yeah. to add there? No? Yeah, yeah, certainly. And, and th those are very, um, very, very uh, important, interesting points raised. Um, no, I don't think that in any corner of the world, the United States is, is viewed as increasingly um, irrelevant. I mean, certainly some countries will try and circumvent the United States uh, at any time today included um, but uh, I, I think this the view still in almost every capital in the world is that the United States is the unrivaled world superpower uh, and if you're an ally of the United States uh, I don't think that the view that that country must work closely with Washington has changed at all and I think that you know, if you speak to uh, representatives from almost any European government, their view still is that U.S. leadership is vitally important. Uh, and we're seeing that very clearly over um, uh, the Baltic states, for example, and, and the, the tremendous threat to Eastern Europe today. 
uh, and you've seen actually a strengthening of the alliance between the U.S. and many of its European allies in the east of uh, east of Europe. Actually, and that, that's a clear-cut uh, example. Um, you referenced um, Iran and you know Russia, Turkey, sort of working closer together. That's that's definitely a reality, but. But I think the you know the conversions between uh, Russian and Iranian interests, for example, were were very very evident under the Obama administration over the Iran nuclear deal, and and the Russians were at the very forefront of pushing for that deal, which benefited them directly, uh, and the Russians have a vested interest in keeping that that deal together for a whole host of reasons, uh, and uh, and I think that um, you know that sort of uh, you know partnership between Moscow and Tehran, I mean, that, that was very powerful already in the, in the Obama years, and President Obama did nothing, frankly, to confront it. Uh, in fact, the, the whole Iran uh, nuclear deal negotiation process really strengthened, I think, the position of Russia. Uh, and the, the Russians will fight tooth and nail to keep this deal uh, together. Uh, and the, uh, the dissolution of the, the Iran nuclear agreement would be very bad news, I think, for the, uh, for the Russians. So, um, so with this administration, I, mean, I think that in terms of the big picture, um, there is a continuing emphasis upon uh, strengthening traditional alliances, but America's adversaries know that they're dealing with, uh, I think, an administration that is far less tolerant of the activities of you know dictatorial regimes that threaten you know U.S. Uh, U.S. interests, and I think that that is the the right approach for the administration to uh, to be um, to be taking actually. Uh, and um, but uh, but you know you raise I, I thought extremely important point. Could I could I just quickly respond as well to? Yes, of course. Uh, just um, just one or two of the points that that, that Dov made, and I, sure. I think that that. Um, my colleague made many extremely important points, many, many of which I would agree with, uh, some I would disagree with. Um, one that I disagreed with um, was your point about uh, Brexit, and, uh, and I think we're both um, Brexit backers and supporters. Um, and, and the point you made about um, you know, the British voting for Brexit because they don't like foreigners, I mean, I, while immigration was an important part of the Brexit debate, and I think polling uh, has shown that it was the second most important consideration after restoring national sovereignty for, um, for the United Kingdom, which is the number one factor according to various uh, polls conducted. Um, but I think that um, you know, Brexit is not about uh, in any way um, an inward-looking Britain. It's very much about an outward-looking Britain that <coughs> returns to much more of a sort of global role a more traditional role that is played over the course of centuries, a great free trading power. And, and, and Dov made great points about the importance of free trade. And this is an area where the administration really needs to, you know, to sort out uh, it, its, its position in favor of free trade. Um, but, uh, but I think you know, Brexit is all about a return for Britain as a, as a great sovereign nation on the world stage that is going to be um, uh, a very outward-looking nation, and, uh, and Britain, I think, within within Europe, actually, has been far more welcoming of of immigrants, actually, than any other country in Europe. Um, and um, you know, if you look at you look at London, um, half the population of London is either foreign-born or the descendants of, of immigrants. And I think London works overall very well, actually, as a big city of 12 million people, um, and it's probably more harmonious than any major city in Europe, actually. Um, and uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, with regard to the issue of, of foreigners and Brexit, um, many in Britain felt that, Brit you know, the British government needed to be able to control who comes into the country and decide who comes in, and so controlling Britain's borders. But that's not quite the same as sort of a fundamental animosity, I think, towards foreigners, which I think uh, is very limited in, in the UK. I mean, you'll find it in any European country, but uh, I think it's far less the case in Britain than in most European uh, uh, countries, and I, I think, do think that Britain's future is very much as a, as an outward-looking global uh, leader uh, on, on the world stage, alongside the United States. And the special relationship will be greatly strengthened, I think, uh, by by Brexit. Uh, and and I think that the you know Brexit is good for uh, not only for Britain, but also for America uh, as well. Well, from your mouth to God's ears, if Jeremy Corbyn becomes <laughs> prime minister, I think all of yes, that changes. No, that's, that's a nightmare, yeah. There's another hand down here on the center <laughs> left, I think. Yes. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm Dave Pollack from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Very stimulating discussion. I, I guess my question is more for Niles uh, because I, uh, I agree with you about where we've come in the last year, but I want to look ahead to the next year. And here my concern is, uh, and I'll speak about the Middle East because I know something about it. Um, what do you see as the Trump administration's next steps with regard to Iran, for mm -hmm. example? How to yeah. stop Iran in, in practice? Uh, what happens if the nuclear deal does collapse? Then what do we do? Uh, what do we do about Syria, and how do we reconcile our interests there between the Kurds and the Turks and the Arabs and the Israelis and so on? What do we do about the broader Middle East issues of Afghanistan and Pakistan in the next year? And on all of those issues, I, I do agree that we've had a useful course correction from where we were a year ago, but I'm afraid I don't see a real plan uh, for where to go from here. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that, that's a great question, actually. And I think the, um, you know, the reality is, in terms of the administration's thinking, it's, it's, it's been, uh, I think, a lot more developed on the Iran front than it has been on, say, Syria uh, and the big picture on the Middle East. And I think that um, you know, Iran, uh, certainly my sense uh, is that the, the Iran issue has sort of um, together with the ISIS issue has sort of dominated um, the sort of the big picture approach on the Middle East uh, with regard to this administration. There hasn't been, I think, a great deal of in-depth strategic thinking about the future of Syria, for example. Uh, although we saw uh, comments um, this week by Rex Tillerson, who spoke about uh, the United States maintaining uh, a military presence in Syria, uh, currently about 2,000 troops. Uh, perhaps that will be expanded. That's a sort of reversal of, of some of the earlier talk of, of you know, the United States um, only temporarily being in Syria. But I think you, you can expect to see a long-term US military presence in Syria, uh, not least as a warning to uh, Tehran, but also to Moscow as well. Um, and you've seen, um, uh, you've seen, I think, a greater willingness on the part of this administration to aggressively confront uh, the Assad regime um, and uh, militarily, and I think you're going to continue seeing that, and that may draw the United States into direct confrontation with, with both Russia and Iran. Um, on, the, on the Iran uh, front, I think the, the strategic thinking has a lot, been a lot more detailed, um, and um, certainly in comparison to, uh, to Syria, uh, for example. Uh, and I think that one of the biggest differences in approach from this administration to the last on Iran has been the treatment of Iran's nuclear uh, uh, program as part of a, of a broader U.S. strategy for confronting a very dangerous uh, rogue regime. So that strategy incorporates Iran's ballistic missile uh, development as development of military uh, capability and capacity. Uh, also, it includes Iran's human rights uh, record as well, which was largely ignored by the Obama administration. So um, w what happens if the Iran you know, deal um, you know, collapses. I mean, that, that's, that's an extremely uh, good question. I, I do think that the likelihood of the United States walking away from the Iran deal uh, 120 days from now is very high, um, simply because there's no real willingness in Europe to amend the agreement. And the statements coming from Paris, Berlin, and Brussels in particular have been vociferous in their opposition to this. I think the British are uh, are far more willing to look at possible fixes to the, the deal. But you don't see that, that coming at all from the, the French or the German uh, side at the moment. And so the idea that Europe is going to move in lockstep with the United States on this, I, I think, is, uh, is at this time unrealistic. Uh, and, um, and Trump made it very clear uh, last, last Friday that he, this was the last chance for, for the deal. And so he can't walk back from that. And so uh, I think it's very likely the US walks away from the agreement. Uh, and the question then is whether you know, the rest of the signatories um, can keep it uh, you know, together or whether Iran itself actually walks away from the, you know, from, from the deal. But without the US presence, I think my, my own personal view is the deal is dead in the water, not least because US sanctions will come back into place.
those sanctions will target any uh, foreign entity doing business with Tehran, whether they're French, German, Russian, Chinese, etc. That's going to have a dramatic uh, impact upon, um, for example, French companies doing multi-billion dollar deals with, with Iran over oil fields and so on. Uh, the Germans do a huge amount of business with, with Tehran. Um, and overall European investment in, in Iran is, is you know, up over 100%. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, that's what's really going to frighten uh, the European countries, this money. Because at the end of the day, the Iran nuclear agreement is not so much about security for European countries. Um, it's about preserving financial interests and stakes. Uh, and, you know, you can be sure they're going to be hit massively hard once US sanctions come back into, into place. And so this is the last chance for, you know, for European governments to, to try and fix this disagreement. Um, I, I don't have a lot of faith in, in European leaders, uh, other than potentially the British government actually doing anything <coughs> about, about this at all. But, um, um, but, um, but you, have to, you have to include the Iran nuclear uh, deal as part of a, of a broader big picture strategy combating an extremely aggressive uh, state sponsor of terrorism. And the Obama administration simply just narrowed on the nuclear aspect without looking at the big picture. And that, that's a fundamental weakness of this agreement, in addition to all of the sunset clauses and the various other uh, flaws in the, in the deal. Jeff, would you have any thoughts on that subject? I've got, I've got lots of thoughts on it. There's, a, uh, <laughs> there, there's a, a couple of other issues I'd like to, to bring up as well, um, Chuck. Just, just as a matter of fact, uh, Niall, you were, you were in rapture over the 12 million Londoners, many of whom come from foreign countries, didn't most of them vote to remain? Yeah, so... It's okay, yeah. so, <laughs> point, okay. okay, that's the only the, point the I wanted to make. The majority did, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So there was one <coughs> issue uh, that I actually was sympathetic to during Trump's campaign, and that had to do with China and its behavior uh, towards us uh, on trade matters. And it was interesting that you never mentioned China, and Dove did, but indirectly through the TPP. And, uh, to my ex understanding, this is, this is the real elephant in the room, is how on earth is this administration going to deal with a country that seems to be so smart they can play him like the fiddle? I mean, the trip to East Asia, which he says was so great, in, in fact, was just a wonderful demonstration of how smart they are at tweaking his ego. And to the most of my knowledge, he got really nothing from the Chinese out of this. He walked away from the TPP. As Dove pointed out, the other Asians who would be with us against China are now lining up with China. I mean, China has these extraordinary infrastructure programs all across Asia into Europe. We haven't even talked about infrastructure um, <clears throat> in this administration. So what I'd like is some sense of when this administration is going to get tough with China. And if they do not, then I think the Chinese emerge as, as the winners in this in the, in the long run. Um, second point, I know it's not foreign policy. But what really disturbs me has been the undermining of trust by this administration in key institutions that are essential for our foreign policy, notably the Department of State, um, the CIA, and the FBI. And it seems to me that, that when you undermine the deep state, I don't, if that's what you want to call it, when you undermine the very institutions that we need to conduct our foreign and policy, particularly at the intelligence level, we're not doing a service to the United States or anyone else. F the final point on Iran, since you asked, Chuck, um, I am not so sure that if the United States tries to impose sanctions on France, China, uh, Germany, all of the Europeans plus Britain, because of the Iran nuclear deal, they will take it lying down. This, this came up before in, 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 in the 1990s when we were going to impose secondary sanctions on Iran, um, and it never came to fruition because Mr. Khatami was elected. 
my guess is this time they will not take it lying down. And, it, and if there's one issue that will poison U.S. relations with Europe, it would be a trade war over Iran. Let me just uh, respond on, on China beyond what I already said. Um, one of the biggest mistakes, you know, the danger or the challenge of all these tweets is if people believe them. If you can convince people to ignore them, then you're okay. But people don't necessarily ignore them. And they particularly don't ignore them when the president then doesn't follow up on what he said. Now, if you recall, during the campaign, one of the things the president said was that on the first day in office, apart from getting rid of the Iran deal, which was going to be the first day of office, and Obamacare, and Obamacare uh, was to call China a currency manipulator. Now, it wasn't entirely accurate anyway because China was being more mature about its currency. But the fact that he didn't follow through already sent a message to the Chinese before, as you say, uh, Mr. Xi kind of played him. Now, one of the, the difficulties with confronting the Chinese is frankly this. Um, on the one hand, we subsidize to the tune of about 90% the Chinese defense budget. How do I come up with that? Take the amount of Chinese Treasury bill holdings, which is about 1.3 trillion. Um, take the interest on it. Treasury hold Chinese Treasury holdings are about one third of all Treasury holdings, so one third of all interest goes to China. It's about 135 billion dollars. Official Chinese defense budget is 145 billion dollars. Guess who's paying for their defense? The other side of it, though is guess who's paying for our defense? Every time they buy a treasury bill and we're running a deficit, they're paying for our defense. This is a very, this is a very complex relationship. There are a lot of companies that have, business, that have plants in China. Now the Chinese are driving companies out with, for instance, their new law about uh, uh, about intellectual property and, and so on, which they just issued and is still being implemented. They have new tough environmental laws that people didn't anticipate. Uh, the minimum wage keeps going up and up and up. It was go not just in double figures, in high double, in, in, uh, in about 18, 17 percent in the previous years. So a lot of the assumptions that led people to put plants in China in the first place are now being done away with. But nevertheless, there's an awful lot of American business in China, a awful a lot of infrastructure, an awful lot of, of the supply chain for American industries in China. So you, you just can't over, you know, throw this whole thing over. And I think this is one of the, the challenges that, frankly, any administration faces. One of the reasons why, if you actually look at American policy vis-a-vis -vis China, frankly, since the 70s, when you were in the government, in the eight, early 80s. Why hasn't it changed all that much? Because that relationship keeps getting thicker and thicker, not thinner and thinner. And it just gets harder and harder. So that, that's on that one. On the intelligence community in particular, I just want to say this. Um, this is another case of where the president said all kinds of things, and he, you know, it's changed. Morale actually, certainly under Pompeo, is pretty good. One of the reasons being Mr. Pompeo, like Mr. Abe, like Mr. Xi, like Mr. Netanyahu, knows how to make the president feel good. And if you make the president feel good, he kind of leaves you alone. And Mike Pompeo has been extremely successful in looking after the agency's interests, in protecting those interests, and in maintaining the relationships with other intelligence agencies around the world, and being open about it. That's the other thing. He doesn't just have those relationships. He's open about the importance of alliances and intelligence relationships. So I don't think that's the bad part. The bad part, of course, is when you impugn the judicial system, when you impugn the media, when you impugn just about everything else. And that's, as I said, the kind of thing that makes Mr. Nat Mr. Netanyahu feel that he can talk about fake news as he does, or Mr. Erdogan feel that, well, you know, he can arrest a few more journalists, or maybe Mr. Putin feeling that he can kill a couple. Governor. If you look at where the Western world is today compared to where we were 
at the end of the Cold War, we're actually in great shape. Uh, and I'm, I was a soldier assigned to Germany during the Cold War, and Germany was only half there. Uh, it seems to me that, that today, if you look at the conflicts, they're all far beyond the borders of where we were during the end of the Cold War. The Western order is really in great shape. And the Russians, the Chinese, and the Iranians are all powers that don't like that and want to try to upset the existing order and in increase their own influence and diminish that of the Western world. That seems to be what I think is going on while we're in this global conflict that we're in. Unless I miss something, I don't remember the United States threatening North Korea. So I don't know exactly what they're, they feel like they have to react to. I mean, I, I, if, if we were threatening to invade and change their regime and all that, I missed it. So I'm not sure what they're, they feel like they have to react to. My question is, is it possible that the North Korean activities are at the behest of the Chinese and the Russians, simply to test us and see how we would react when directly confronted by a country that, frankly, nobody has any real stake in? And it's really a test of the United States. It has nothing to do with Korea uh, or North Korea. It has to do with what we'll do. And if we don't do this right, they'll feel they can push forward much more strongly the way they have been in Ukraine and, and the uh, South and East China Sea. Is it possible that North Korea is only a stalking horse? Kyle, you want to take yeah, that? That's a very interesting um, question. It's, it's significant, actually, that, um, you know, with regard to. Uh, uh, to North Korea, um, the Russians have been e extremely unhelpful. The Chinese have barely lifted a finger. I mean, there's a lot of sort of, you know, language from Beijing about, um, you know, working with the United States and North Korea and so on. But, um, but the, um, you know, the, the the reality is both China and and Russia really have done nothing to rein in uh, North Korea, and and they see North Korea as an opportunity to undermine. U.S. power and influence uh, in Asia, um, and so they're playing their own sort of great power um, uh, game here. And and the idea that uh, either you know the Russians or, or the Chinese are, are suddenly going to you know jump in to help help us out and so on. I, unfortunately, I don't think that's going to that's going to happen. Well, we can certainly be a lot more aggressive in terms of going after, for example, Chinese banks who are um, aiding and abetting the uh, the Russian. Uh, sorry, the uh, the North Korean regime, um, and um, the the Russians are also employing a, a fair amount of sort of de facto um, um, uh, North Korean sort of slave labor, I think, actually. And so the, the Russians are are up to their necks in 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 some respects, um, supporting this this regime. So it's all about, in my view, a sort of uh, weakening America's strategic position. So I think you raise, uh, you know, a very very important um, uh, points there. And uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, I, I do think with the Trump administration that sometimes the, the messaging coming from Washington is contradictory and confusing on North Korea. And they have to really speak with one voice from the administration of North Korea. And they have to um, strictly enforce the sanctions that are in, in place, a lot of very strong Treasury sanctions, for example, that have not been enforced. Um, and uh, the you know the strong sanctions approach. I think, you know, has to be, um, you know, has to be enforced and, and implemented. The idea that North Korea is the most sort of sanctioned country on earth it simply isn't isn't true. There's a lot more scope for additional sanctions against uh, North Korea. And the sanctions, for example, that have been in place against, for example, Zimbabwe, um, Sudan, with very good reason, have actually been tougher than the sanctions in place against North Korea. And so there's a lot more scope. Uh, for strengthening the, those those sanctions, but but I think that the broad, the broader point that you you raise about Russia and China that they are working to undermine the United States and the free world at every opportunity they they can, um, especially when it, uh, when it comes to North Korea. I think that's that's uh, that's correct. Dimitri, <coughs> I agree. Russia and China are trying to undermine uh, U.S. Uh, positions on North Korea and in many other areas. Actually, on North Korea, I think. <coughs> that the Russians are doing a lot of things we don't quite understand. There was a recently a Russian military delegation in North Korea. There was a Russian parliamentary delegation in North Korea. Uh, and uh, I have uh, a strong impression uh, that the Russians are using the porous border uh, 
to provide North Korea with a lot of things they want. Uh, and uh, I think you're absolutely right about the Chinese banks. But here is my problem with uh, uh, your argument now. The problem is that Russia is not a friend of the United States. I think that Russia by now is an adversary of the United States. Reasonable people may disagree of how we came to this point. But now Russia clearly is an adversary of the United States. I don't know whether China is an adversary of the United States, but certainly a very major uh, competitor. Iran, to put it mildly, is not a friend of the United States. But you know, what worries me is when we talk about our foreign policy successes, it reminds me of a parade, whether it would be in St. Petersburg or in Berlin before World War I, uh, when the orchestras uh, allowed, when everybody is marching, when the crowds uh, are very pleased, because it looks absolutely great. The United States is the only superpower. When we decide to demonstrate our strengths, it is inevitable, it is predictable that uh, our first moves would be successful, like our first moves, let's say, in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, and in Libya. But then you begin facing real problems <coughs> and real challenges. And I will ask you about two. You mentioned Russia and Iran. I actually think that Russia would not mind the United States attacking Iran. It would be very helpful for uh, Russia's relationship with Muslim countries. It probably would dramatically increase the price of oil. And the Russians rightly or wrongly believe that it would help their relations with the Europeans. Now, because Russia uh, does not want to alienate the Rouhani government, they cannot say it publicly. They have to be careful. But if we decide to attack, I expect that uh, the Russians would be exploiting it royally and would try to persuade the Chinese that for the first time they should start thinking about some genuinely close military cooperation. On uh, <coughs> Korea, you're absolutely right in describing how China and particularly Russia treat North Korea. But if we are taking the position that these two nations are both adversaries, if we put them under more and more sanctions, why wouldn't we expect that they would act as adversaries? And my last question to you about the support of Russian dissidents. Well, we can support Russian dissidents, except we have some limitations because Russia is not a free country. We know that, right? And there are a lot of things Putin will be able to do to restrict political discourse in Russia, particularly if it can portray it as foreign interference. But if we take this route, do you believe that we will be able to stop Russia from interfering in American elections? Is it your assumption that just punitive measures would persuade Russia not to interfere in the American political system if we would be interfering in theirs? And I'm not talking about moral equivalence. I'm talking about war. If you do something to the other side, wouldn't you expect that there may be some kind of retaliation? And how would you handle it? Grant. Yeah. Well, th well th th thank you. Uh, thank you for your, for your questions there and um, some very important uh, observations, I think. Um, but um, just uh, starting with, with your, your last points about, you know, about Russia, um, and my understanding is you're, you're saying that um, the West can be construed as provocative to 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 Russia, uh, and that can uh, make the situation worse. Is that no, is that yeah, okay? I yeah. I am saying that if somebody is your yeah. adversary, yeah, and if you want <coughs> to squeeze your adversary, and are not offering them mm -hmm. any incentive, mm -hmm. wouldn't you expect that they would try to do something to you, and how would you handle that? Yeah. Um, yeah, and my, my response is that, um, you know, the unfortunate reality with the, the present uh, Russian regime is that there's no real move, uh, sorry, room for maneuver with this regime. As long as Putin is in power, and he's definitely going to be in power for another um, six years following the, uh, 
uh, you know, the, the sort of fake Russian election that's coming up um, shortly, and Putin will be, be in place for many more years. And, and as long as he remains in, in place, I, mean, I, I don't think that we can actually, we can work with Putin at all. Uh, and we have to treat him as a hostile, uh, extremely dangerous uh, adversary. And uh, I'm reminded of uh, the time, um, the days when I worked for Margaret Thatcher in a private office in London. And at that time, uh, Putin was just uh, rising to, uh, to power. Uh, and she believed, uh, you know, back then, um, uh, back in 2000 or so, that, you know, Putin could simply not be trusted. And she was someone, of course, who had worked with Russian uh, you know, reformers in the past, she saw in, in Gorbachev someone who the West could do business with. Her view of Putin was that you could never strike a deal with him and that he would become an extremely dangerous opponent for the West. And I, as was usually the case with, with Margaret Thatcher, she was sort of often decades ahead of her time. And I think her analysis then was absolutely um, uh, spot on. So I see no alternative to the building up of uh, U.S. and broader NATO military might in, in Europe as a warning to Russia uh, because the cost of liberating the Baltic states would be far, far greater than the cost of defending them. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, the, the liberation of the Baltic states, if indeed the Russians made a move for them, I mean, you, th this would be, you know, in effect, sort of World War III, really. Uh, and so it, it's far better for us, I think, to focus on, on defending NATO territory, ensuring the Russians do not in Rocha, you know, upon that, and um, and without a doubt, as, as you mentioned, I mean, the, the Russians will continue to seek to interfere in U.S. elections, elections all over Europe, wherever the Russians can potentially interfere, they're going to do that. Um, and we're seeing that time and again on, on European, uh, you know, soil as well. Um, and, and their goal, of course, is to sow the seeds of, of sort of confusion, uh, to muddy the waters, and, and to cast doubts over the legitimacy of governments and so on. And, and they're extremely good at doing that. Uh, and um, um, uh, on the point of, you know, with regard to supporting dissidents, um, uh, again, I, you know, draw from, you know, from Margaret Thatcher's example on this. Um, she believed that what you say in private to uh, international leaders is the same message you must give in public as well. Uh, and so, you know, she went to Moscow in 1987, I think first visit to Russia at the invitation of Gorbachev. Um, and uh, she actually went on Russian TV condemning the communist system. Uh, and uh, she, you know, she was unafraid to uh, also uh, visit Russian dissidents, to stand with them, to call for their release. And, and so this was very much her approach. And I think it was a very effective one for dealing at the time with the Russian regime. I think in terms of dealing with Putin, uh, we're dealing with a far more difficult and potentially dangerous government uh, right now. But I think the same principles apply that uh, it is important for, for example, the leader of the free world, in this case, President Trump, to stand with those who are fighting for their, their freedom. He, he does that already, I think, uh, with regard to Iran, Venezuela, Cuba. He hasn't done that on, Rush, uh, on the Russian issue, probably because he wants to maintain a uh, semblance of a, of a sort of working relationship with Vladimir Putin. But the Russians respect only one thing. They only listen to one thing, and that is, that is real strength and resolve. And that's what we need to see projected from the U.S. president. I do think we see it reflected in policy. But Donald Trump's own personal role here uh, is, is critically uh, important in the support of those who, uh, you know, who are fighting for their freedom in the face of uh, what is a you know, brutally uh, you know, oppressive regime. Um, you both talked a little bit about the, uh, the new national security strategy. Um, I want to uh, raise somebody who, uh, whose name is not often cited here in Washington, but who was once a, a very influential thinker on the topic of, of U.S. strategy, and that's Walter Lippmann. Uh, he, of course, had a, a very famous dictum when it comes to strategy, and that is that your capabilities and your objectives in the world had to be in some kind of rough balance. And when your objectives greatly exceeded your capabilities, you were headed into trouble. Um, the national security strategy, as it's published, doesn't appear to address that uh, dictum at all. It doesn't prioritize among our interests. Uh, and it appears to uh, believe we have unlimited capabilities, unlimited resources. Uh, 
And what's surprising, I think, in, in reading this is that one would not have expected that if, if you had rewound the tape a little bit, gone back to the campaign rhetoric of, of uh, then-candidate Trump, who was essentially saying, you know, our, our objectives in the world, our operations in the world, our broader approach to foreign policy has gotten way out ahead of our skis. And we need to, to think about a way of bringing these things back into balance. So I wonder if you could comment on this question of balancing objectives and, and capabilities. Well, uh, Jim Mattis, I think, gave it a good try today, actually. Um, they, the, uh, this which you can get hold of, the uh, national defense strategy, which, as he rightly pointed out, is only part of the security strategy. Again, he did emphasize over and over again the importance of diplomacy and that military capability is essentially uh, an adjunct and support for diplomacy rather than a replacement for uh, that's not something you necessarily heard from my old boss, Don Rumsfeld. Um, his, what the strategy says here is very explicit that Russia and China are the priorities. And he was actually asked, well, what do you do about, you know, counterterrorism? And he said, that is a function of training and education um, because the kind of people who are operating in a counterterrorism mode are working among civilians, they're working in alien cultures. They really need to have, you know, it's not just learning, you know, not to show your heel, your, your, the bottom of your foot when you're in Asia, stuff like that. I mean, serious stuff. Um, but it clearly lays out priorities. Now, he then addressed the question, rightly so, uh, can I fund it? And, of course, our system of government <coughs> calls for the Congress to do the funding. And he literally railed against concurrent resolutions and the, you know, the, the, budget, uh, the budget Control Act and, and all of that, not, none of which seems to be going away. So it really begs a larger question, which is, should you lay out your objectives if you're not sure you're going to find the resources? And it seems to me that if you admit that you might not find the resources and you, you acknowledge that, but you say, look, I am changing the direction in the event that I find the resources, I think it's terribly important because they have, to their credit, I think, the administration has shifted that order of priorities. I mean, under Mr. Obama, it was all about drones and special forces. Now it's about facing off against Chinese and Russians, which is a very, very different set of requirements, to put it mildly. Uh, and so I think they're, frankly, to be uh, commended for that. Whether they can convince the Congress to come up with a deal that spends more on defense. And by the way, he also emphasized, you know, we really do have to be more efficient. You know, they're actually going to have a, an audit. My predecessor as comptroller was supposed to have an audit. I was supposed to have an audit. We are now dealing with my successor's successor's successor finally coming up with an audit. But they are. So it seems to me that they're, they've got it right. The one unknown, and truly, as Rumsfeld would have said, the unknown unknown, except this is a known unknown, really, is Congress. And if the Congress does what it should do, then this strategy actually holds up pretty well. Let's put, let's put just a little more granularity on, because you brought up a, a very good point here. I, to my mind, the biggest, the elephant in the room isn't China. The, the elephant in the room is a $21 trillion debt that our new tax bill has just added another trillion plus to, while 10,000 baby boomers per day are entering the entitlement rolls and shooting to the point where that debt, we collapse it in the most recent calculation by, by uh, uh, OMB is we collapse in, in 2032, where Debt service, and this is with optimistic uh, 
uh, rates uh, and interest rates, we uh, spend all of our revenue on entitlements, have nothing left for defense, nothing left for any other form of government. So to be talking about, well, the Congress is the problem. Yeah, of course the Congress is the problem. The President's the problem. The American people who demand more than they can, uh, than they're willing to fund by way of taxation are responsible. Putting all of that together and matching it somehow against a set of national security objectives is, we aren't even coming close to doing that, it seems to me. So, I, sorry for the intervention, but I, the, the, the most serious, Mike Mullen, as far as I can remember, is the first prominent national security figure to point out that the biggest national security threat to this country is the debt. Anything, it isn't ISIS, it isn't China, it isn't, it's the debt. It's the debt, stupid. It's the debt. Well, I would just say, I'm, I don't disagree with that. Again, if it, if it all winds up being just uh, debt service, then we'll be funding a much larger Chinese defense uh, budget. Well, the difference uh, but, when but they, the, find, uh, they fund our defense, but, they're funding but ours. we end up with more liability. But <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, if, if you're in the national security world, then you've got to answer the question, I think, the way I did. If, But it's a much larger question, and I don't disagree with that. Okay, we got to back there in the back. Okay. Hi, John Moody from Fox News. Uh, best guess from both of you, which Donald Trump shows up in Davos, the successful billionaire businessman or the blustering boob from America who shows up in mucklucks and trucks uh, <laughs> snow and dirt into the World Economic Forum? You want to go first? Yeah, Mark? yeah. That, that's 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 really the um, you know the most uh, uh, interesting question of the of the other day. Um, you know, I think that we could see both potentially. Actually, uh, on the one hand, I think that um, you know Donald Trump will be in his element on the economic issues, and you know whatever the criticism of, of Trump on so many fronts, um, his record of, of running successfully the U.S. economy creating jobs uh, and uh, creating generating wealth is is outstanding uh, and and I think that um, you know he will be moving in circles in, in Davos where you know you have a lot of uh, I think finance ministers businessmen etc who will have uh, you know a lot of respect for what he's achieved here in the United States in the first year at the same time I th my sense is that uh, President Trump will not be able to resist throwing the occasional uh, bomb here and there at, uh, you know, uh, potential opponents. So, for example, um, uh, you know, there, there's a good chance that he will, um, you know, go out of his way to contradict, say, Angela Merkel, for example, on the issue of, you know, refugees uh, and uh, or, or open borders or, you know. So I, I think you're going to see both Donald Trumps here. On the one hand, the extremely effective uh, business leader uh, and second to none, I think, on the world stage in terms of his record on that front. And at the same time, you're going to see, you know, D Donald, uh, D Donald Trump, the, um, uh, you know, the, the outspoken, uh, unrestrained, you know, leader of the free world who's not afraid to cause offense at uh, a place like Davos, which is a sort of um, uh, a place for generally sort of very, very, you know, measured, uh, you know, talk, and um, it's a sort of place that, uh, you know, European leaders love to go to talk about, um, you know, uh, advancing the European project and so on. And, and so I think he, he will not be able to resist the opportunity uh, to, to um, uh, throw a firework into the, um, in, into, into the setting and, uh, and stand up firmly for what he believes to be, uh, you know, American uh, interests, and it's going to undoubtedly horrify, you know, some of those uh, assembled there. So I think we're going to see both, actually. Yeah. Tell how many Trumps go to Davos. I think I, I agree, although I have a different reason for agreeing. Um, Mr. Trump wants everybody to think he's a successful businessman. That's very different from having been one, um, but having the desire to impress all those businessmen, I think will be uppermost in his mind. And so to that extent, he's going to want to come across as a successful uh, manager of the economy. 
one can debate whether it's really him or preceded him. You know, that doesn't matter. That's how he's going to want to come across, precisely because of the businessmen in the audience. I think where he will cause ructions, and again, I agree that the, he will try, is on trade. That's where I think he will make a, a very forceful statement in terms of why he views trade so differently, not just from the Europeans. Remember, who is now the steward of, of free trade? It's Xi Jinping. And so I think he will try to show that precisely because he's such a fantastic businessman and man manager of the economy, he knows better about trade. All right, we have one more minute. Um, uh, you have 45 seconds to say whatever you missed, uh, wish you'd have said that you didn't so far. And Doug, you're going to have that, and we're going to go slightly over 2 o'clock. Right. Um, yeah, just to conclude, you know, I, I think promising first year, uh, I think it's going to continue to be a, a roller coaster ride on the foreign policy front in, in 2018. Um, a lot of aspects of, you know, will be, I think, un unpredictable. And, and this is a this is a president who um, is the, the most unpredictable, uh, you know, leader that, that the United States has had in many, many decades in some respects. But at the same time, though, hewing to a, a traditional view of American leadership, that American leadership really does matter on the world stage. And the reality is that Trump may not be the most popular figure uh, globally, but um, I think that he's increasingly uh, respected by America's allies as someone who delivers on what he says and promises, and he's increasingly feared by America's enemies. And that's not a, ba that's not a bad thing, actually. And so I, I think we're going to see the continuation of that in 2018. I'll look for three things. Uh, first, look for what happens on Korea, clearly. Secondly, look for whether there really is a Middle East peace proposal after all the promises that have been made. And third, look to see who's Secretary of State. If Mr. Tillerson is here a year from now, that tells you something. Uh, if he is not and he's replaced by Mr. Pompeo, that's probably an improvement for the State Department because Pompeo clearly will have more clout with the President than Tillerson does. If he's replaced by someone who is totally inexperienced, Nikki Haley, again, would, would I think be okay in the sense that people, she's a known quantity. But if, for whatever reason, he chooses someone else, say another business buddy from New York, um, we're in for a wild ride. All right. Let's give him a big hand. It was a good, good event.